here is a list of the types of solar cells and a somewhat dated review of the efficiencies. So, for all of these efficiencies have improved by at least 3, 4, 5 percent. Okay. Uh, we will discuss uh, the efficiency improvement over the years that has happened. So, the most uh, common type is the silicon single crystal solar cell that is the most widely commercially available today. Uh, the band gap is 1.1 electron volts. The open circuit voltage is 0 0.71. Uh, and uh, the best efficiency in 2013 power share was 70 uh, percent. Today, 22 percent, 23 percent silicon solar cells are fairly common. Uh, good quality silicon solar cells. Another a somewhat cheaper option is silicon multi-crystal solar cells. So, these are not made of a single crystal, but multiple crystals of solar cells uh, are present in a single solar cell. Okay. So, these are often called polycrystalline solar cells and these are made up of multiple smaller crystals or grains. Okay. Now, these are easier to manufacture because uh, single crystal solar cells manufacturing costs are higher. Uh, recently, with improving uh, manufacturing processes, the cost have come down significantly for manufacturing of single crystal solar cells. But still, multi crystal solar cells are significantly cheaper than single crystal systems. The problem with multi crystal cells is there are grain boundaries, the boundaries between the various crystal lattices. Okay. And these boundaries act as uh, shunts through which electrons and holes can flow through the interior of the solar cell bypassing the forbidden zone of the space charge region and uh, recombining internally. So, as a result, they have significantly, uh, significantly lower efficiencies compared to single crystal solar cells. So, for example, in 2013, its best efficiency was around 13 percent, laboratory efficiency was around 20 percent. Okay, so idealized solar cell efficiency for polycrystalline was around 20 percent, for a single crystal, it was 25%. So, there is a 5% efficiency hit because of the presence of grain boundary. We also discussed germanium earlier. So, we remember, if you remember, its efficiencies are quite low uh, because its spectral efficiency, uh, the total theoretical efficiencies are quite low because of the lower open circuit voltage and the voltage factors are quite low. Furthermore, these are germanium is chemically active, that is, it is not very stable. And hence, they are only used in conjunction with other cells in a multi-layer uh, solar, uh, multi solar cell, as we will discuss later in this class. Okay. After this, you, you get nanocrystalline or amorphous silicon. These are what are called thin film solar cells. Okay. So, usual solar cells are more than 200 micrometers thick. So, if you look at the thickness of this solar cell, it's, uh, uh, if you see here the total thickness here, uh, the P junction is 250 to 400 micrometers, the N junction is 0.2 to 1 micrometers. So, this is also important. The PN junction is as close to the surface as possible to collect the maximum of the solar energy. Okay, So, the P side is quite thick, the N side is quite thin Okay, and uh, the, uh, it's uh, doped in a gradient basis so that all the electrons can easily go to the collector. Okay. But the total thickness is therefore around 250 to 400 micrometers. So, as a result, where the thin film system, the thickness of your semiconductor is just 1 to 2 micrometers. The entire solar cell is like a thin film of 1 to 2 micrometers. So, one of the advantages of a thin film solar cell is the material costs are significantly lower because you are using very little of the semiconductor material. So, these are kind of printed over sheets, deposited or printed over sheets of about 1 to 2 micrometers of active uh, semiconductor substrate. Okay. So, these are obviously not crystalline because they are very thin film. So, you are having nanocrystals or amorphous silicon systems. Now, it is not noted here. Uh, so, the band gap is again around 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, the open circuit voltage for amorphous and nanocrystalline is around 0 0.54 and 0 0.89. Okay. And these are in development. The maximum lab values was around 10 percent efficiencies. Okay. So, because these do not have a uh, coherent crystal structure, 
the resistances uh, within the thin film is significantly higher and you get a lot of recombination losses as well. Okay. As a result, the total electricity that you are getting is lower, the collection efficiency is lower and you are also getting a lot of losses due to transmission losses and losses because not all the photons have sufficient residence time within your thin film to be interacting with your electrons to promote the electrons to uh, uh, to create generate current because of the thinness of this films. So these efficiencies of the thin film based silicons are significantly lower around 10% to 12%. Okay. However, these have uh, commercial applications like flexible solar cells, solar cells printable, printed on flexible materials, uh, um, so, uh, uh, solar cells that are printed on electronics to do local power supply etc. Okay. These are not currently being considered significantly for grid level solar cell systems. Then you also have other types of materials like gallium, arsenide and cadmium telluride which we discussed earlier. These ones gallium, arsenide and cadmium telluride. These also because of their uh, limitations of their crystal structures, these also can only be uh, deposited as thin films. Okay. So, so that of course these have higher laboratory efficiencies of 28% to 17% because of uh, their inherent higher theoretical efficiencies uh, but uh, they have a uh, because they are based on thin film techniques there are certain challenges in employing them on a uh, end mass kind of a system okay however they have quite a lot of promise uh, in developing uh, cheaper and high efficiency solar cells in the future there are also other types of this kinds of thin films copper indium gallium selenium kind of thin film systems uh, again a uh, multiple types of uh, uh, materials that are combined together to create your semiconductor material these have uh, commercial efficiencies of around 15 percent and laboratory efficiencies around 20 percent okay so what you see here is that uh, silicon single crystal solar cells are the most widely used followed by uh, multi-crystal silicon solar cells and certain types of thin film solar cells which have high potential to be commercialized for different types of applications. The next type of system that we will be discussing is multi-junction solar cells. So these multi-junction solar cells are trying to tackle the basic difficulty of solar radiation that it has a whole range of frequencies some are so low that electrons cannot be promoted for a given uh, semiconductor and some are so high that a lot of thermal losses are taking place in such cases so the question is what if we could create multi-junction solar cells where you have a solar cell made of multiple types of semiconductors with different band gap energy levels. So you have a specific semiconductor junction with high band gap that specifically caters to high energy photons so that you minimize the thermal losses. You have another set of uh, another junction with low band gap so that you can also capture and promote uh, 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 capture the low energy photons using the low band gap part uh, semiconductor system. Okay. And, and an intermediate one to capture the intermediate photon. This way you can minimize both the thermal losses and the transmission losses and increase the available spectral efficiency and has a theoretical efficiency of your solar system. So these are called multi-junction solar cells. Okay. So here is one example of a multi-junction solar cell. So uh, this solar cell is often called this. gallium, indium phosphide by gallium, indium arsenide by germanium, triple junction. Okay, 
So it has basically three junctions, one made of gallium indium phosphide, another made of gallium indium arsenide, and finally you have a germanium triple junction. Okay. So this is the top cell indium gallium phosphide, middle cell indium gallium arsenide, bottom cell germanium. Top cell span gap is 1.86 electron volts. This is the blue zone which is capturing the uh, high low wavelength that is high energy photons and minimizing the thermal losses of these high energy photons with a 1.86 electron volt junction. Then you have a middle cell of indium gallium arsenide which has a band gap of 1.4 electron volts. So this is responsible for capturing wavelengths between 750 to around 1100 nanometers. Then your bottom germanium cell is responsible for capturing 1100 to around 1800 nanometers which is the infrared range of the solar spectrum. So that's this way your thermalizing and transmission losses are significantly minimized. Okay. So here the idea is, uh, so this emitter and the base, this, so this is the P n junction, n and p, this is the n plus and the p plus side as we discussed you need to have a gradient. So indium gallium phosphide base p n junction here, then indium gallium arsenide based p n junction here, then indium gallium uh, germanium based p n junction here. Okay. Now the issue, these cells are connected in series. Okay. And the issue is this is p side, this is n side. So the electrons from this side must be connected to collect the electrons on this side. So here we have a specific tunnel junction. So there is no direct contact between these two cells uh, here to, so that the electrons here if they so this is n side right electrons are coming here and these are holes so if they recombine here then all the current is lost so what we have is some sort of a tunnel junction that connects the uh, that uh, uh, collects the electrons here and move it here collects the electrons here and move it here okay so that there is no direct flow of electrons across the three cells okay so that is very important and this increases the complexity of this system. That's number one. Number two is this makes these three cells series connected. Now, a series connected cells will have a single current. So, we have to ensure that the number of electrons generated here is equal to the number of electrons generated here and is equal to the number of electrons generated here. Okay. So, this balancing so that the currents at each of these cells is the same amount we also needs to be very carefully designed so the cells have to be very carefully designed so that the current matching can happen otherwise part of the current will be lost okay. the third problem is this cell has to be crystal matched this so the crystal structure has to remain uh, coherent and uh, coherent from between the various materials otherwise there will be significant losses due to crystal defects that are coming up you have multiple materials it's not just silicon right you have multiple materials from the top to the bottom and the crystal has to be generated so that there is no mismatch and large-scale crystal defects from the top to the bottom which will lead to large-scale shunt losses okay so these three limitations make it also very efficient also very costly so they are primarily used for research applications or space applications where cost is not that much of a factor. So if you are sending a probe to Mars and you want electricity out of sunlight there, you want high efficiency, but the cost is not a factor there. So there, multi-junction solar cells or in defense applications where cost is not that much of a factor, you can think of multi-junction solar cells because they have very high efficiency. So this can be seen. So this is the uh, this is the data from NREL, which is National Renewable uh, Electrical Energy and Electrical Institute in the US. And you can see this is the multi-junction solar cells. And this is up to only like uh, 2005 or something. Okay. And you can see that even in 2005, the multi-junction solar cells was 36 percent efficiency. Now it has touched around 40, 42 percent. Okay followed by crystalline silicon, lab-based crystalline silicon solar cells. These have currently reached their maximum limit of around 28% here. So it's going like this. Multi-junction can go up to 40%. Okay. Then you have the thin film technologies, copper, indium, gallium, silium, SIGs, cadmium, telluride, amorphous silicon. These range around 
the lab scale. So these are the best quality solar cells generated in lab. So they are uh, currently uh, at that time was around 16 to 20 percent and they have remained around 20, 21, 22 percent at that range. And then you have also something called organic solar cells made up of a completely different technology. We will not discuss this. These have currently reached around 10 percent efficiencies. So these are the best research cell efficiencies. And you can see here that multi-junction solar cells do not have that limit of 30 percent. It can go up. So now we are, uh, so this is your solar cell, okay. Now solar cells are put into a series of, uh, so each solar cell is connected in series to the next solar cell to create your module. So each of these is an individual solar cell and these are connected in series. How are they connected in series? This is the structure. So the bottom is the rear contact, this is the front contact, right. So we are looking at the top view. The front contact, the rear contact of the first solar cell is uh, connected to the front contact of the next solar cell. Okay. Remember, front side is N side. So, electrons are being collected from the front side and uh, holes are at the back side. So, electrons are entering from the back side. Okay. So, positive charge, the positive lead is on the back side of the final cell and the negative lead is the front side of the first cell. So back side, front side, back side, front side. So back to back, back contact of the first cell leads to the front contact of the second cell. Back contact of the second cell leads to the front contact of the third cell and so on and so forth. And finally the back contact of the last cell is connected to the grid, external cell. And this creates a single module. And this is the module that is shown here. Okay. This is encapsulated. So this entire module each of these solar cells, you have this, uh, uh, this, this entire system, right? You have the front leads, the anti-reflected panel, the N++, N, P, P+, then the back contact. And this entire module is then uh, connected, uh, encapsulated in ethyl vinyl acetate encapsulate, okay? Which is uh, thermally stable and also does not uh, reflect or absorb sun, okay? And then this is... Uh, Everything is placed in an aluminium box and a glass frame, tempered glass frame. And this is the junction box at the bottom that is connecting this module to other modules. Okay. So here is one module like that. This module is this one. Now several modules may be connected in parallel. So series connection basically increases the voltage while keeping the current the same. Correct. So the total, uh, see each solar cell each solar cell is a voltage of 0 0.6 volts only, okay. So you increase the uh, voltage of the module by connecting each of them in series. So let me just write that down. So here, solar cells are connected in series to increase voltage uh, 36 solar cell module will have VOC of the order of 22 volts and ISC of the order of 5.5 amps. Okay. Now these modules may themselves be connected in parallel to great higher 
uh, current. Now connect several of these modules in parallel. So you can have a 36 solar cell module with a VOC of 22 volts. A 72 solar cell module will have a VOC of 44 volts, so on. And each of these modules are then again connected, which will reduce the voltage. But now the currents are added. Correct. And this is also very useful because suppose one of these modules, one of these solar cells is somehow broken. Then this entire module will stop working. Correct. Because suppose this solar cell is somehow uh, got damaged and is not passing current from the top to the uh, from the bottom to the top okay so then this entire module is off okay you, you cannot pass current anymore okay so this is like your uh, uh, your uh, blinking lights that are connected in a chain if if one connector goes out the entire light system goes out okay so this entire module can go out because of the damage to one solar cell within the 72 or 36 cell module okay so then you need these modules to be connected in parallel so that the other other modules working can still deliver the current to your system okay and there is no complete failure of the entire system okay so you have uh, modules in parallel also which decreases the voltage but increases the current and you are getting a finally kind of 4 amperes to 15 volts kind of system okay So next, once these modules are connected, there are many ways you can connect the solar cells uh, to the grid. Okay. So there are two most popular ways of connecting solar cells to the grid. One is at the user end and another is at the grid level. Okay. So you will see that many uh, commercial uh, stores, uh, societies, etc. We have local solar cell areas. So these kind of uh, what are called uh, user end okay solar end, end okay so micro generation at or near a building or a commercial site which is whose primary task is to supply the electricity requirements for that commercial zone or for that building or for that uh, institute okay so you have these kinds of photovoltaic modules whose the total uh, power generation is around 5 kilowatts so these are kind of medium range photovoltaic modules of around 5 kilowatt and these are uh, creating dc current that is being uh, converted into ac through an inverter system and is supplying the uh, needs of a specific building okay now this is this building is also connected to the local grid so when the electricity generated by the solar cell is greater than the electricity required by your building part of that electricity is being fed into the grid okay and the grid is actually giving you money uh, when it is getting that electricity out of it. So uh, the excess electricity you can actually you are selling to your electricity generator uh, generator like your local uh, power plant or your local distributor. And the distributor is giving you money if, 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 if he or she is getting electricity from you when there is excess generation and your building requirements is not as high. Okay. Whereas when your solar cells is not able to generate enough electricity, you are sourcing uh, part of the electricity shortfall from the grid and you are paying for that. Okay. So this kind of creates a flexible system where you have the security that you will get electricity from the grid when your local solar cells do not generate enough electricity. You also get the financial uh, uh, gain that you can sell your electricity to the distributor for the excess electricity to the distributor and hence your bills are significantly lower. So this kind of system is very popular abroad and also is becoming popular in India uh, in, in many places. Okay. The other thing is a dedicated power plant, a dedicated solar pump for commercial uh, 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 electricity supply to the grid. So this is not a user side system, this is a kind of a big scale solar farm that is generating a lot of electricity. So here, here you have 100 kilowatt array. So this is 5 kilowatt. This is around 20 times higher. 20 uh, and it can be uh, 500 kilowatt arrays as well. So large scale solar plants which are directly sourcing uh, your electricity to uh, uh, converting into firstly to ACs and uh, tra transferring it to high tension wires to substations and transformers and you are tra tra and, and you are transferring the electricity into grid lines. So this is a traditional system. So instead of a thermal power plant, you have a solar pump that is generating 100 kilowatts, uh, 500 kilowatts of electricity and transferring it to your grid. Okay. So this is 
so uh, that kind of shows the current pv architecture the infrastructure and the technology and with that we uh, finish our discussion of solar cells uh, for today okay so thank you for listening and we will come back with a new uh, a chapter in uh, uh, renewable and sustainable energy technology in the next class thank you